the reasons why I don't trust men to write stories about women is that even when dealing with our trauma, it's from their point of view. So massive warning, uh, trigger warning here. But I want to, I'm going I'm to go into an example of um, when it's done like well in terms of really having the intended impact without traumatizing the audience or maybe even the actress while filming it. I mean, I don't know. I didn't ask her, but I just appreciate the way it was handled in this one scene. But before I get into that, the reason why I can't stand it when men write these stories and throw in grape as just like a plot device, or like a lot of them, I believe Sam Levinson and um, especially Quentin Tarantino and all those geniuses, I believe that they're just like doing stuff to their actresses that they want to do. It's like a fantasy, like, oh, I'll write this story with all this grape so that I get to watch it, right? They're catering to the appetite to see women being tortured by men. You know, there's a word for it, you know, trauma corn. And we know that that white filmmakers, especially white men, tend to also do this to black indigenous and other people of color. The stuff that they make is is really intended for white people. And whether they realize they're doing it or not, are showing a lot of things they really don't need to show. Um, I believe to satiate this sick and twisted, violent mindset, you know, that's based in white supremacy, capitalism, anti-blackness, misogyny, all this crap, right? It's all tied together, y'all. And that's why I'm so tired of like rich white men, specifically, you know, cishet rich white men making everything because they're, they're making it for themselves. Even the stories about us who they don't even see as human beings. So when they write about women, the point of view of the camera and what they choose to show is so critical. So even if the point of view of the camera isn't the actual perpetrator, like we're not seeing it through his eye, a lot of times they're choosing the angles that they choose, the close-ups, the, the facial expression, like those are very intentional decisions. And they, they, they are almost never focused on the victim and the lived experiences of that victim. Now, and so when I saw it done like right in my mind, where it seemed to be very respectful, and I'm pretty sure a man actually directed that. I think, yeah, I'm positive a man directed this episode because I think I've talked about it before. I don't know who was in his ear telling him that he needed to do this because I don't feel like he would, na- <laughs> any man naturally thinks to do this. But talking about the li- what it's like to actually experience that level of violence and anyone who's experienced it, which like, again, I believe most women, if not all women, have on some level. Don't believe statistics, y'all. I didn't even realize how many times I've been graped until just this year because I didn't really understand coercion. Anyway, when it's something super violent especially, the victim is almost always going to dissociate. It is a survival mechanism. It is almost critical for her to endure that level of trauma is to get the F out of there in terms of her body and just, you know, right? I can, I remember exactly, I started making jokes in my head. Oh, well, I thought you're too old to get great. Like, I literally remember thinking that joke while it was happening. I was so unbelievably horrified and shocked that it was actually, I was like, what? What? I'm in my late 30s. Ah, this, I mean, I, li- that's, I, I got my mind busy, right? With the little inner comedian, because, you know, comedy is, is, humor is oftentimes a trauma response. And I believe that, that <laughs> I used that to survive my childhood. And all, you know, every time I've been through something, completely traumatizing, uh, the first thing I think of is jokes. And I don't think I'm the only one. But the other thing that a lot of victims tend to focus on is something in the room, right? Um, There's been several times where, you know, when I was disassociating and it wasn't violent or anything, but I just really didn't want to be there. I had been manipulated into that situation. Um, I remember being like, really like noticing like stains on the ceilings. Or the pattern of the, the, the curtains, you know, like some like detail. And, a lot, and that's and then my humor would kick in being like, look at that. Like that doesn't match. What the, you know, like I, and <laughs> that's the disassociative voice that's trying to protect me coming in. So let me show you this scene from Mad Men that made me think this is a very trauma informed perspective. And it's also hyper focused on the receiver of this violence and her experience rather than the audience, you know, being entertained by this somehow or on the perpetrator's point of view. And again, a lot of these men in Hollywood are perpetrators. They're predators. So we are seeing everything from their point of view. They choose 
who we're focusing on and what they're experiencing. And that's why, like, it's not that grapes should never be used. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a part of life for most women on some level, unfortunately. But it's how and when it's used and why it's used that I have a big problem with. So this scene in Mad Men um, where Joan is graped by her husband, which a lot of people still don't really understand that this is grape. You know, doesn't matter if you're married. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to show anything, y'all. So I'm going to show a few pictures, but none of them are like violent pictures. But, you know, whatever. If you are not comfortable with this, obviously, please take care of yourself. But the whole premise of the, or the whole thing behind this scene is that, you know, her husband is super insecure and controlling and he's suspicious of her. And he also wants to do this to her in like the big man's office, right? This is all about power. It always is. And men's insecurity and entitlement. And so he's like, come on, let's go into you know, the big man's office. And she's like, uh, clearly didn't want to go in there, but like, you know, okay. And then they get a drink and then he comes up behind her. And he's like, hey. And she plays it off the way so many women do. Being like, hmm, she makes a little funny joke. <laughs> and then he is like, it's okay. God, it's okay. Every abuser has said it's okay it's okay just calm down while i'm doing this traumatizing thing to you this unbelievably violent thing to you it's okay and so then she's like okay no for real stop and he's like you know your boss knows a lot more about you than uh he should you know he's like uh i've been here for nine years of course and he's like mm -hmm. and then he starts getting violent so then he kind of wrestles her to the ground and the thing is is that this isn't even super violent y'all and that's the point most grape is not super violent, even if it's unbelievably violent, because she's just like trying to fight back, but also knows like, ugh, like, what's the point? She keeps trying like, no, I'm serious. This isn't fun. This isn't fun for me. And he's just slowly taking her down. Now, there's a few shots of like him pulling down her um, pantyhose or whatever and her fighting. Right. We see their hands. The thing we never see is his face. I don't want to see that Borker's face. I don't want to see how much he's enjoying it. I want to see how it's impacting her. And they did a really good job of focusing entirely on its impact on her, not him. It's kind of cut off here. Sorry, y'all. This is what we see. Most of the grape is this. A close-up of her face and her hand being pinned down and her desperately, sorry, I'm getting choked up right now. Her desperately focusing on something in the room like hyper focusing on something in the room, disassociating, not being in her body so she can survive this. So she's staring at this couch. And the whole grape scene is about this couch being her lifeline to her humanity. This couch is keeping her alive because her disassociating is the thing that's keeping her alive right now. Because if she actually took in what's happening to her and especially who it's happening from who's doing this to her her husband who she's legally tied to and this is in the 50s or maybe 60s at this point this is in a time where she doesn't have her own money in a bank account right can't have a bank account um i don't remember if she has a baby with him yet but it probably like this woman is screwed this is her captor and now he's resorting to this so she can't think about all that so she's gonna focus on this couch until he's done and this is what we see the whole time half her face trying to stay alive. I have never felt so seen until I watched that. I have never understood how amazing I am for surviving that. And, and that what I did is normal, right? Because I thought because of men have been making this stuff in Hollywood that, you know, I'm supposed to fight and fight and fight and fight. No, at a certain point, you're like, okay, okay. Just get this over with because it's too dangerous to fight. Especially, if the, I mean, first of all, it's a man. And second of all, like, if he's a violent man and you know he's a violent man, has been violent before, there's no saying no, dude. You either accept this as best you can to stay alive or you fight and maybe die. So the thing is, is that that scene made me realize why it was months later that I felt dead. That it took, it was months later until I was out of that relationship and in a safe home and like things had settled down and I wasn't in like survival mode, that that's when I had a hard time getting out of bed and that it makes sense. And that my body and my psyche and, and me personally responded in the best possible way and good for me for handling such a horrific situation so well and surviving to someone trying to kill my soul.